You're watching Capital Connection from the Illinois State Capitol. Welcome back. All week we watched across our state and across our nation as activists and demonstrators marched in the streets and demanded to be heard. But what was it that they were trying to say? Joining us now to help offer some perspective on this is House Representative Cam Buckner from uh, his home office in Chicago, the South Side. Representative, good to have you with us. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for having me. Uh, th there was a lot of pain expressed this week on the streets of Chicago, on the streets of our state and our country. Um, a lot of activists went out and uh, expressed what I heard as anguish and rage. Uh, what, what is it that, uh, I think this is obvious, stemming from the death of George Floyd in the hands of police in Minnesota, uh, in Minnesota rather, um, with what we saw there. But when I listened to some of the speakers, they also talked about centuries of similar pain. Uh, what, what is it that, that you heard that, uh, that people are trying to express right now in, in this moment? You know, I, I think um, you hit the nail on the head as you began, right? This was about pain, uh, but this was pain that has turned into anger. And, and while George Floyd's death in, in Minneapolis was the catalyst for many of these demonstrations, both in, in uh, Chicago and around Illinois and across the country, um, it, it, it wasn't the, the cause, I think, for um, a lot of these, these feelings for people. People have felt this for a very long time. This is not just about his death. Um, this is about the death of, of, of hundreds of folks who have been unarmed and, and killed by law enforcement. But furthermore, it's also about economic disinvestment. Uh, it, it's about you know um, neighborhoods and places not feeling uh, safe, healthy, and educated. This is about people feeling marginalized and forgotten and ignored. And it came to a head and we see it now uh, at full tilt across uh, our country, um, but specifically, you know, in, in the district that I represent, I'm seeing it every day. Uh, we heard from our leaders, uh, even President Obama, uh, who said there is no rationale for criminal behavior. He was referencing the, some of the rioting and looting that did happen. Other leaders said that's a distraction from the larger message. Um, so I won't ask you to rationalize or justify any of the rioting or the looting. Um, but when you step back and you look at that from the broader perspective, what do you think that signified? Was there, was there some larger scream uh, being heard there in that act, in, 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 in the act of looting? or in, uh, Was there some intent on the part of some to sort of share some of that pain or rage with other communities that maybe hadn't felt it the same way? I think this is about you know the the, the age old adage of, of comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable. Um, this was about to a lot of folks spreading the, the pain around. It was about spreading the anguish and making sure that people understood uh, that that people were upset. Um, you know these these neighborhoods in, in which these happened, this, these things happened. People did not feel as if they were um, owners or or even a part of the community. They felt like they were um, occupants, right? And, and uh, you know what, what? What we saw play itself out in the most starkest terms uh, is that people wanted their voice to be heard. And, and while you know we we condemn the criminal the criminal acts, I, I've heard from people in my district and across the city because I've been out in this community um, you know every day since since last week. Uh, and and their their call is that you know you 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 you've told us not to 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 scream. You've told us not to yell. You've told us not to to protest, um, and we're tired of you telling us how to react to the things that are happening to us every day. We see the jerseys on the wall there on the helmet. Uh, you played for the University of Illinois for uh, a while, uh, some years ago. Uh, with your experience in a locker room and on the gridiron there, I, I wonder if you might have any reaction to uh, the words we heard from uh, the New Orleans Saints quarterback, Drew Brees, this week, uh, who took this moment in this time to weigh in on uh, what we can assume was, was Colin Kaepernick's protest years ago, uh, kneeling during the national anthem. He said he couldn't respect anyone who disrespected the, the flag. If not then, or if not in that way, then where and how? Yeah, you know, um, th th this one was really important to me as I saw it unfold yesterday. Um, you know, not only am I a football guy, but I, I spent a decent amount of time in the city of New Orleans um, I, I lived there for a number of years, and, and I know Drew. I, I know Drew, um, uh, and uh, you know, while I, I have always respected him as a as a as a good person, uh, I am very troubled by the, the things that he said. Right, um, not just because they were tone deaf, and I think 
um, out of touch, but I think Drew made this situation in this moment in time about him. Uh, instead of, you know, I think stepping back and trying to understand the totality of the circumstances, the, the larger things at play, you know, um, you know, he he uh, he made a I think a huge huge misstep, and I think he'll have to atone for that at, at some point. Um, there are a lot of folks who did not understand Colin Kaepernick's protest when he did it, uh, but now when you juxtaposition it against a police officer also taking a knee right on a person's neck uh, and then ending their life, we've got to look at this in a much different way and throw our biases to the side. Mm. If a riot is the language of the unheard, and if the success of a protest is measured by how many people hear it, then how would you grade the success of Colin Kaepernick's protest? Well, I, I think a lot of people heard it, right? And, and I, I think that it was, it was something that, uh, that people were able to internalize around the country. However, uh, if, if you look at you know what, the the fact that we are still um, talking about you know unarmed black men being killed by police officers, you know we, we've not made it there yet. We're not at a spot where the the protest was successful. And I think a lot of it was because it got oversimplified um, and conflated, and and the the real meat of the argument got lost in a bunch of minutia. Um, and I think that's what we got to be careful of moving forward as a as a society, as a country, to not you know lose the forest for the trees and not overshadow what all of these things are, are really about at their core. It seems that in flashpoints like these, there's two directions forward. There's this instinct from some to uh, flex and, and steel themselves against what they see as an altercation with some of the looting or the violence. We saw some people call for taking up arms or taking baseball bats to their storefronts and standing to protect. And there's this fear of altercation. There's this fear of violence that, that we saw some people brace themselves for. There's an alternative approach where a conversation begins and people empathize with one, one, one another and understand uh, how do you make sure that, that our country moves in one direction and not the other, given some of the, the, the heavy militarized uh, response we've seen, some of that uh, necessary. Governor Pritzker even deploying a National Guard to make sure that people's property was safe and people's uh, you know, belongings were, were protected and, and, and all that. But uh, moving forward, and, and now that this conversation has started, there's this opportunity. How do you keep that conversation going? And how do you have the conversation itself? I think it begins and ends with transparency and vulnerability, allowing people uh, who may not think or, or may not come from the same, you know, ideological background as you to, to, to open up and, and change your mind, right? I heard a long time ago, if you can't change your mind, you can't change anything else, including the world. Um, giving people an opportunity to, to have those conversations. You know, um, I think even at our, our highest levels of government, we've got to be able to talk to, to um, the people on the ground in, in a real way. How, how do you explain to someone that uh, you're concerned, you send the National Guard because you're concerned mm -hmm. with protecting property, but uh, why, aren't, why don't you have the same concern with protecting life, right? And so these are conversations that we have to have um, you know, it's okay to have hurt feelings. It's okay to be uh, uncomfortable because that's the only way that we can move uh, the needle uh, in, in this conversation at all is by having no, that and, and, and addressing these wounds that have, have been here um, for centuries. I was stricken this week, if I can share this story, just with the difference that it must feel like watching some of these scenes play out on a screen from the safety of your home and your couch and, and seeing it. Um, and the difference being there, uh, I was uh, at uh, one of the protests that, that broke out uh, in the streets of River North, uh, Chicago, perhaps uh, in your district even, uh, on Saturday night uh, a week ago. And it was a chaotic scene. There was a, a young man taking a baseball bat to a storefront salon window, maybe just 10 steps from me. And we captured that footage and saw it there. But, you know, we're supposed to stay neutral, objective observers as journalists. It was hard to do that in that moment. Uh, I was, frankly, afraid uh, because I didn't quite know. There was no uh, law enforcement around to protect me. I didn't know what stopped him from turning the bat from that window to me. Uh, I was heartbroken for the small business owner who owned that salon, who lost a lot of value there, uh, 
maybe it'll be covered by insurance, but no fault of their own. And frankly, in the, in the moment, I was, I was angry that someone could treat someone else's property with such disregard. And, and, and then almost immediately, I caught myself and I thought, wait a minute, maybe that was the point. Maybe for a fleeting second, I felt what that young man must have felt his entire life. Fear for his own safety in his own home or in his own neighborhood. Heartbreak that his neighbor's property was treated with disregard. And anger that someone else, an officer of the law even, might afflict that kind of violence on someone else for passing a fake cigarette or a fake $20 bill. And I wondered if maybe that was the point. I think that is the point. I think that is the point. And, and I, I, too, um, have been in the middle of at least a half dozen of, of these, these demonstrations, these protests since this happened. Um, you know, on Sunday afternoon, I was with uh, you know, my family celebrating uh, a birthday here in my home. And, and you know, we heard helicopters and we heard sirens. And I just walked down the street and, and I walked into the middle of one of the larger you know, protests that, that was um, occurring here, here in the city. Um, and, and what I know is the way I felt in, in, that, in that situation and, and how it affected me. Um, there were a bunch of my neighbors there. There were a bunch of cops there. There were a bunch of media there. Um, I've never been afraid of my neighbors. I've had times in my life where I've been afraid of, of law enforcement. Um, but to see them all converge in that heightened sense of anxiety uh, and people you know, attempting at that point uh, to, to go from, from protests to, um, and some, there was some looting that was involved uh, in that situation as well. Uh, and, and to them, once again, it, it, was, it was about, um, you know, making people uncomfortable. Uh, these are folks who live in these situations their entire life. These, these are folks who, um, once again, feel marginalized and, and feel like there is no one that listens to them. We live in the richest country in the world, and yet we have, you know, so many folks that live under the poverty line um, without any lifeline for them. You know, in, in, in the last 30 years, China, India, and, and Indonesia have been able to pull a billion and a half people uh, out of poverty. But here in America, we don't have that same uh, that, that, that same result. So I think people are just fed up. Um, they are screaming at the top of their lungs. And, and, and Mark, I, I can't help but think that this time has to be different because it just it feels different. And I think the results will be different. Yeah, again, uh, just reiterating and repeating some of the different remarks I heard from speakers on the stage of a peaceful protest in Springfield earlier this week. It was how long will it take? Uh, it seems that there, there is that sort of, uh, there are some flashpoints of violence and looting and rioting in, in some parts of it, most of it remaining peaceful. But even through the violence, through the, the looting, there has been a generational restraint. You can hear it in their voice. There has been, uh, you know, a, a, if, if I can actually just point back to some words that you spoke on the House floor last session. I believe you quoted Malcolm X during the this debate about uh, legalizing uh, recreational marijuana uh, for profit. Um, first of all, I, that quote about uh, sticking the knife in someone's back, not recognizing that it's there, those words come back now. It, it seems like, again, our society is trying to wonder, trying to uh, grapple with that very question. Has there been, uh, you know, a, a generational uh, crime committed, essentially? It, it feels like it. And when I, when I um, honestly, I, I'm actually glad you brought that up because the, the protests last Sunday uh, marked a year since we uh, legalized cannabis in the, in the House, right? Uh, and since I, I spoke those words on the floor, and what I was trying to convey then are, is the same thing that a lot of people who are in the streets right now um, are, are trying to convey. Um, there, there has been, you know, uh, what people feel is general, gen, uh, generational marginalization. Um, but not only do they feel like they've been pressed and pushed in a corner, they feel like they've had no way to address it, no way to talk about it. And so there are many of us for whom this is not, not shocking. This is not news. This is not something that came out of the blue, right? We, we, we saw it boiling. We've seen it boiling for years. Uh, but there was a, finally that, that spark in, in the Twin Cities, which ignited the flame, and we're seeing it, uh, you know, spread all, all around the country. It's interesting because it, it, it does seem as though we're watching the debate between Martin Luther King and Malcolm X play out before our eyes. 
right? There was the, the demonstration in Springfield on the steps underneath the statue of Lincoln, but right across the street facing that direction is a statue of Dr. King. And he, of course, said, you know, the, the best way to do this is through love and through peace. But I heard a speaker, if I could just reiterate again to, to, to you their words, was we tried peaceful. That was the direct quote, quote, we tried peaceful. I don't condone looting, the speaker said, but we got your attention, didn't we? It seems as though there's this flirtation with going the Malcolm X route in, in their disagreement over whether political violence was okay to prove a point or whether the peaceful way was the way forward. Where, where do you come down? You know, I, I, um, I, I do believe that, you know, um, we've got to shake up, shake the tree. We've got to do things a little differently. Um, I never, I, of course, condone, condone violence or, or criminal acts, right? Um, but you, you scream loud enough so people can hear you. But if people continue to not listen, uh, then you react in a different way. We always have heard that uh, insanity is doing things the same way and getting the same result and continue to do it and expect something different. Um, and that's what we're seeing here in these streets. Uh, we also got to remember, as we call these people, you know, um, you know, rioters and, and looters, um, you know, what's happening right now is very much in line with what has happened throughout the history of this country. Um, and the history of this country is peppered with young people who have been fed up who have decided that they're going to, you know, approach things different than their mother and their dad did or their, their, their grandparents did uh, because they want their voices to be heard, you know. Um, and so while, while I want to protect life in them, um, but by, by you know, uh, any means necessary, I do hear and understand the strife in these people's voices. Uh, you know, I talk to young folks in my district on a normal basis, and I, what I've said is that, you know, we, we, we cannot rightfully talk about three or four days of um, civil unrest or three or four days loot of looting in, in our community when we don't talk about, you know, three or four generations of looting of our communities. And that's, you know, schools and hospitals and, and, and housing and other things that we try to fight for when we're in Springfield. You know, we've got to have a real conversation, show the, the blame where the blame is, and then find a way to, to move forward. Yeah. Uh, an interesting conversation. I'm, I, I appreciate you uh, sharing some of your perspective uh, with us on that. Uh, Representative Cam Buckner joining us from his home office. Thanks for uh, hopping on. Appreciate you, man. Thank you. We're back in just a moment with the Shriver Center on Poverty Law to look at where some of this conversation, where some of this momentum may lead here in Springfield. We're back in a moment.